Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Um, I'm very excited to be with you here today. Um, what I'm going to be talking about is why I'm optimistic about the next 40 years of human history and how we together can create a better world. So, slides, please. So every day we look at the headlines. Maybe we get a USA Today in front of our hotel room. Maybe we read the Wall Street Journal. Maybe we read the New York Times. And we see all these different headlines. And you might see things like Greece is collapsing, or the euro is going to explode, or California meltdown, or individual health plan costs soar. Or you might see Girl Scout cookie sales crumble. No! <laughs> Why, USA Today, are you trying to break my heart with Girl Scout cookies, the last thing I have left? We need to increase sales of those. And so we see all these headlines that make us think one thing about the world. And sometimes it's hard to know, are we actually making progress as a human species? So let me talk about that today. So I've got one big question I'd like to look at. Are we making progress as a species, as human beings? And over the last 40 years, as our parents have grown up, become leaders, have we made forward progress or have we not made forward progress as a species? So let's look back at the last 40 years. Many of us remember some of those historical moments so vividly. Most of us have lived through most of that time period over the last 40 years. And so much has happened in the last four decades that it's hard to get a sense as to are we succeeding or are we not succeeding as human beings. So how can we even tell with all that information, with so much happening, are we doing better or are we doing worse as human beings? So I think it's very important to zoom out to not read the day-to-day -day headlines as we try to think about that question, but to actually establish some metrics. And so let's establish five KPIs, five key performance indicators for humanity. Number one, life expectancy. How long does the average human being live? Infant mortality. What percentage of infants or what number of infants out of a thousand die before their first birthday? Per capita income. What is the global average income per year for a human being? What is the percentage of individuals, percentage of human beings that live under what the World Bank defines as ex the extreme poverty line, which is a dollar and 25, 25 cents per day in income, about $400, $450 per year, purchase power parity adjusted. So we have a couple health indicators, we have a couple economic indicators, and then we have an environmental indicator. Let's look at carbon dioxide emissions as well. And so what has happened in the last 40 years on these five KPIs? Let's start with life expectancy. We've gone from about 59 years globally to today about 69 years globally. So about a 17% improvement just in the 40 year period that we've seen. On infant mortality, we've gone from 95 deaths out of 1,000 in the first year of life on average to 41 today. That's an amazing improvement in just 40 years, 57% better. On per capita income, 
We've gone from an average per capita income, now this is inflation adjusted, $2,010, from $781 per person per year on average to $9,216. And when we all remember the Lehman Brothers bankruptcy, Merrill Lynch, Bear Stearns, the crash of 2008, and when you look at it on the course of a 40-year period of history, it's almost barely noticeable in terms of its impact. We're making progress. Here, at least in total income, divided by the total number of people, so that's mean. But what about this view of median income? What about this view of, you know, we have greater income now, but is it being distributed fairly? Is there too much income inequality? So you have to look at not only the effect, uh, are we getting wealthier on average, but also, um, are we taking care of people at the bottom billion, the sort of lowest tiers of society? So it's important to look at, is extreme poverty going up, or is extreme poverty going down? And there are a lot of different ways you can measure poverty, $2 a day, $1.25 a day, some are economic, some are non-economic. The best way I've seen to do it is to take $1.25 per day, which is just barely enough to get by on the basic human needs of food, water, shelter, basic education, and basic medicine, and to see what percent of humanity live under that measure. Now today, in 2011, 19.5% of the world lives under $1.25 per day. So imagine what that must be like to get by. And that is purchase power parity adjusted, which means it's the same basket of goods here as there that we compare. However, that 19.5, 19.6% is a lot better than it was 40 years ago when 52% of the world lived under $1.25 per day. And actually, this is the statistic that goes back only to 1980. Uh, the data wasn't collected in survey household samples prior to that. And so just in 30 years, a 62% improvement and reduction in extreme poverty. And so it might not seem like it when we look at the news or read the headlines, you hear about the, these crashes or Europe uh, coming apart. Um, what we've seen in North Africa and in the Arab Spring in the past six months. But my view, and in terms of human progress, the welfare of the human species improving, that the last 40 years have been the best 40 years in human history and at the greatest rate of improvement for society. But I think there's a big but to that. There's a big however. And that's where this fifth KPI comes in. And it's just a measure for how is the environment doing. And can we, we have all this improvement. We're living longer. Babies are dying less frequently. Uh, we, get, we have more money. Fewer people are in extreme poverty. But 200 years from now, will we have a world that actually exists? Um, and if we have all this income and all this consumption, but a world that doesn't exist, does that matter? And so you have to look at carbon emissions as one proxy of that. 105% increase. It's doubled in this same 40-year period. And you might say, oh, crap. You know, we, we're so optimistic here, but then maybe we shouldn't be. And you look at, I'm not trying to make any cause and effect connection here, just looking at NASA data. Temperature anomalies on land in centigrade have gone up in the last 20, 30 years. And so could we create a report card for our parents? And if we did, what would it look like? Well, I'll propose this. I'll propose we've done pretty well in life expectancy. I'll give us an A. Uh, infant mortality, A. Per capita income, we've done very, very well. Now, that hasn't always been distributed exactly fairly, but there has been a correlation between increase in wealth and, in and reduction in poverty globally. Extreme poverty. 19.6% of the world today going down. That gives me hope. I'll give us a B there. And then carbon dioxide emissions, it's doubled over that 30-year period as we've gone through this rapid phase of industrialization. We need to change something there if we're going to create a world for the long term, a sustainable world. And so that's the past 40 years. But now it's 2011, soon to be 2012, and we have this world as young leaders that we're inheriting. And what will happen over the next 40 years is the question I want to talk about now. Um, so we're in charge, or if we're not in charge, we, we soon will, will be. Generation Y, individuals born between 1975 and 1995, you could call it. You know, we're somewhere between 35, somewhere between 20 and 35 at this point. We're either in charge or we soon will be as leaders. So what's going to happen in our lifetime? As I'm 27 today, running a company, an entrepreneur, social entrepreneur, as I go from age 27 to age 67, what demographic effects, what changes might we see? So global population be about 9 billion. It just passed 7 billion a few weeks ago. 
be about 9 billion by 2050. The demand for global energy is predicted to double. So some of the earlier statistics were from the World Bank Development Indicators. These statistics are from the Party Center for International Futures, which actually studies the predictive data going forward. Double energy demand, however, fossil fuel usage is actually predicted to peak around 2030 and start declining. Why? Because we're going to start using sustainable alternatives to fossil fuels. Why? How can we afford that? Well, there's an amazing thing going on beyond, behind our view if we were to just sort of zoom out. And that's within a decade, it's expected that the price per kilowatt hour of electricity from solar power and wind power will be equal. It will reach grid parity with the price of electricity coming from fossil fuels. When that happens, we'll no longer need huge government subsidies to invest in solar, to invest in wind, to, to invest in hydro and other alternative energies. The market will take care of it. And you'll see tremendous increase in the next 20 years in the usage of alternative energies because every year we're seeing a new Moore's Law of solar power where the price per kilowatt hour from all those photovoltaic cells that are being invested in is coming way, way down and halving every 18 months. And right now it's about six or seven or eight times more, but that gap will narrow here in the, in the coming decade. So beyond alternative energies and a sustainable future, we're going to see internet access become ubiquitous. This is just what's happened in the last 15, 20 years since 1990. We now have over two billion people, about a little over two-sevenths of humanity on the internet. And not only, they're not on dial-up, they're not on satellite, they're on fast broadband. Today, 10% of the world is on broadband. By 2050, 85% of humanity will have access to fast internet, whether it's on a desktop, a laptop, a tablet, or most likely a small handheld smartphone. And so smartphone access is becoming ubiquitous. You see an interesting trend in India and in parts of the developing world in Africa where there are more smartphones than there are computers, and where there are, there are often no landlines, but there are many, many, many smartphones. And so we're living longer. Um, we've gone from 59 to 69 in the last 40 years, probably go another 10%, 70 to 77. Now, of course, in America, we already enjoy a 79-year average life expectancy, but this is the rest of the world catching up to our current standards of living. And so this is a one where it's sort of hard to take a path of data and extrapolate it into the future in perpetuity. You can get in, da in dangerous situations when you do this. However, if you did take the rate of reduction of extreme poverty that we've achieved as a species over the last 30 years and plotted that out linearly into the future, you get to the point where it's approaching zero by 2029. And that's really exciting. You may have heard about the Millennium Development Goals, where there's a lot of emphasis right now to half the number of individuals living in extreme poverty by 2015. So I don't know if we'll ever get to exactly zero, but if we can get under 5% in our lifetime in the next 40 or 50 years, that's a tremendous achievement, considering that in 1800, 210, 211 years ago, 99% of the world lived in extreme poverty. So we're becoming more educated as secondary schooling becomes accessible going from 22% to 45% of the world with access to secondary schooling. And we're seeing all of us become more educated, particularly women. And one of the keys to development in uh, developing parts of the world is women's education, girls' education. And we're seeing not just increases in primary school and secondary school attendance, but college attendance from 7% of the world today, having gone to college, to 20% by 2050. That's uh, three times, 200% increase, with women uh, significantly going to college faster rates than men. We're going, this is a sort of 150-year trend from rural agri agrarian agricultural societies to urban societies. We'll go from 51%, half of humanity in cities today, to 67% in 40 years. And all the while, we're getting wealthier. We hear all this stuff about a recession or an increase, but the fact is, the global GDP is projected to grow by 3.5% in 2011. We are seeing a rate of growth that's pretty significant. And with the rule of 72, that means that about every 20 years, about every 25, 30 years, the amount of uh, income in the world on, on an inflation-adjusted basis doubles. We're becoming wealthier, and we're projected the average human being today, $8,100 per year. Now, that's a bit deceptive because that's skewed by all the people in this room that probably make way more than that. 
Um, there are a lot of people that make $500 a day, $1,000, sorry, $500 a year, $1,000 a year, and that skews it. If you were to look at the median human being, it'd probably be more like $1,500 per year in income. But the average today is $8,100, and that's going up to over $18,000 by 2050. And we're going to see major innovations. 3D printing, the ability to print out a 3D object that can actually have utility. Think about what that's going to do to manufacturing. Nanotechnology, the individual small particles that enable us to create in science, in manufacturing, individual genome sequencing. You know, we're, we're very soon going to be able to, at a low cost way, be able to submit a sample of our blood, get our genome sequenced in an affordable manner, and then get custom tailored medications based on our DNA. That's something that's probably less than a decade away, and that is going to change the world and enable our health to be so much better. So much hap is happening with AI. I mean, think about 100 years ago, the mainframe computer didn't exist. 65 years ago, the mainframe computer was just being built, and today we have, you know, the, I the iPhone in my pocket now has the more processing power than the iMac that sat on my desk 10 years ago. It's low-cost private space travel, all kinds of things. These are just some of the things we're going to see. A lot you can't even predict. So what's going to happen? Governments will have to adapt. There's going to be more transparency, more property rights, more visible metrics. All the authoritarian regimes are going to continue to get overthrown in the next 20 or 30, 40 years. You're going to see Africa's population reach 2 billion by, 2025, or by 2050. China will have the world's largest GDP by 2026. India will be the world's most populous nation. You're seeing 10 years ago in the cover of The Economist, Africa was called the hopeless continent. This week's issue is Africa rising. And so we're going to be leading the next 40 years. That's right, we're in charge now, whether you like it or not as our parents. It might be a little scary, but I think we can do a pretty good job. So six things that are different about us. We're deeply aware of social issues. We know about the need for a sustainable environment. We see business and entrepreneurship as tools for positive change in the world. We're used to a faster pace of change. We're, we're tired of the status quo, and we're innovators. We're connected through technology, social media, our pocket cell phones like never before. And we have the tools to overthrow corrupt, despotic, totalitarian, authoritarian regimes. And that is going to make a big difference in the world, as we've already seen. So my question to you, people under 35 in the audience, is how will you make a difference in the world? It's, we have an absolutely amazing four decades ahead of us. And personally, I'm very optimistic and I'm so excited for what we have to come in the decades ahead. Um, Winston Churchill once said, a pessimist sees the difficulty in every opportunity, but an optimist sees the opportunity in every difficulty. And that is entrepreneurs and innovators and in our generation, that's the way we think, regardless of what some headlines say every day. So as we see these myopic headlines, keep the long-term perspective in mind and work hard as committed and caring leaders to make a world that is sustainable, to create economic growth that is broadly shared, and economic growth in a world in which we don't destroy the actual planet that we live on. I think we can end and will end extreme poverty in our lifetimes, and I think we can do that in a sustainable way. So I think it's time to show what we can do to our parents. Thank you, everybody. Glad to be here this morning.